Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Good afternoon, everyone who are watching us in this Portillo International Music Festival and Academy. We are here in Portillo in a very beautiful day. We had a very bright morning and now we have some clouds. Nonetheless, it has something very magical that whatever the, the climate is, it's always beautiful. So we want to bring you here and enjoy just as if you were here in this beautiful place that it's in the Andes Mountain. Today, I have the pleasure to present Andres Gombra, Chilean scientist. This is very this. He works in the Valdivia Study Center and of Scientific Studies. And I think that Scientific Center is a very great jewel of the science world in Chile, but also globally. I want to read what Andres Andre does. Because maybe most of you, when I finish reading this, maybe you know what what it means. So it's wonderful to have you here uh, to open our possibilities in this world. He I, now has research in gravitational, cosmology, high energy physicists, black holes, and other other topics. The beauty of this talk is that Andres will connect music and science. Yes, we have music, music and Alzheimer and uh, the other dimensional diseases, and then music and social transformation, and then music and understanding this social ecosystem and musical ecosystem. And today we have a great opportunity to connect this two worlds that are science and music in a lecture that is called The Music of the Cosmos, that is the title of one of Andres's books. So I'm really happy to be able to present Andres and to have you here this afternoon. So I'll leave you with him. I hope you enjoy and I'm sure you will. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. And thank you for the generous presentation. For me, honestly, it's an honor to be in a place that it seems that it's not my place. I'm a scientist and I dedicate myself to the black holes and physical physics. What am I doing in a music festival? So I thank you for inviting me because I've always thought that the separation between the human disciplines, between the subjects are fake and even dangerous. They take us away from huge pleasures and joys and the possibility of, of drawing other from other, other inspiration. What I want to share with you are some connections. The connections between physics and music are not evident, but rather subtle, but it shows how it's still important to us. We, we are not each a discipline or a country with borders that we can't cross. So I'm gonna share my screen to show you what I'm, we're gonna to try to do today. Share a video because I also wanna show some examples. Okay. Entonces, cual, si no, se está viendo Right. I hope you're you're seeing this. If not, Angelica, let me know. So as Angelica said, I'm come from the scientific study in Valdivia, the center of scientific studies. And what I'm going to talk about is in part in this book of mine that was recently published. Some of the topics I'm going to talk about I hope to at least speak about the first two. There are three musical pieces. The first, the ballet, the mechanic ballet. This is a story which has this inevitable connection between music and weaponry, 
how music led to war. It's a very deep thought and from war towards modern technology. So this is something to, to get us warm in the topic. Then I'm going to talk about the most famous story, the most famous relationship between music and science. Girl. We're going to do it by the Beach Boys, the song Surfer Girl from 1963. Then we're going to talk about how the birth of science that we understand today is very associated to the music. And finally, I'm going to use a EDM song, contemporary, to talk about the death of science, which is the other side, the other, the other side of the coin. So we're going to talk about the mechanic ballet, mechanical ballet. This is a musical piece composed by George Zenta, a composer, American. It's from 1924. And this is also from a movie from Fernand Leger. This is a big, important piece from the experimental movies, cinema. It was fundamental because you, you, because it was first thought to synchronize music with the movie. Leger add George Santa to to write the composition for for the soundtrack. It was never thought for the soundtrack to be played with the movie. A lot of people thought that this couldn't be done. It was that we were lacking in technology, but others thought that it was possible. So what happened? But what's important is synchronizing. That is important. We're going to talk about how it connected. It's connected to this woman, Heidi Lamar. She was an actress from Austria that became famous in Hollywood. Heidi is a, a character. She started in the 30s in Austria. She made the first uh, erotic movie or considered erotic in, in the cinema. And then she married a, a arms dealer, Fitz Mendel, in the 35. And she was very unhappy because Mendel was, a, was very sexist and he was very upset with these erotic movies, erotic for that, those times at least. Today we would be watch it on Disney Channel probably. So he wanted to destroy all the roles. He didn't let her work. He was very sexist. She was desperate. And she was a housewife, basically. In the 30s, no one knew, however, that Heidi Labar was a genius. And that listening to the conversation that happened in her house with this arms dealer that invite Nazis to his house to discuss arming the, the, Germ the Germans, she learned about military technology and she was self-taught. She would think about it. No one, she wouldn't tell anyone. No one had any idea that she was an expert in, in weapons. And at some point, she runs away from Austria. She ends up in the U.S., in Hollywood. And there she does various movies, very successful. She was known as the most beautiful woman in the world. If you see the photo, you can see she's beautiful. And nobody would have imagined that after her, her recordings, she would arrive to her mansion, to a workshop, to work in weapons technology. So what happened? Heidi Lamar was desperate for war. She was from Jewish Jewish origin, so she would see how the how the killings were happening in Germany. She would see how Austria was occupied violently by the German military, and above all, she saw finally how the German submarines, the U-boats, were sinking a lot of British ships, and she would see the news 
of how children were being sunk as well. And she proposed something completely insane, you would say for an actress in Hollywood. She thought, and how would it be possible to create a televis televised torpedo to destroy the, the Germans? Strange, but that's how it was. And she didn't just achieve it. She actually achieved a technology that is so important that it follows us until today. I'm going to tell you very shortly, because we have a lot to talk about today. Let me describe this technology. In, that, in those times, we didn't have televised torpedoes. Torpedoes worked as bullets, but they but they didn't move towards you. And there are, there are ways through radio waves to direct them. But the issue with radio is people we don't use the we don't use the dial anymore to synthesize the radio. But if you want to communicate through radio, you have to choose a frequency. Same in the dial when you want to hear like Beethoven radio. That's a 94.7, that's a frequency in megahertz. So 97.7 thousand times is that frequency. It's like a wave. So you had to agree upon a frequency. The same thing happened with the torpedo. The torpedo had to have an antenna and be synch synchronized with the operator. The problem with that is that if the enemy could undercover your your frequency they could interfere with the signal and take over control the same thing happens with telecommunication i don't want you guys to hear me and if i tell you my frequency you know how to hear me so what she dis discovered was simple and but revolutionary today she discovered what we know today as a frequency jump what does that consist of If I want to talk with one of you, what I do is I quickly change the frequency. I, I jump from the, from the frequency. But it's not the radio, but let's say I, I connect to 97.7, then I go to 98.3, and I jump very quickly, and I confuse the enemy, and the enemy can't keep up with my jumps. And as soon as they, if they catch my frequency, I'm on to the next one. And it's very quickly. So what's the problem? We need to be synchronized. So we're back at the word synchronize. So the torpedo as the controller need to be synchronized and jump to the same frequencies. How do we do that? I'm gonna jump again. This is like a conversation with, with a soundtrack. So this is George Anthile, the musician that did that score that was never a score, but it ended up being a, a musical piece by itself. George Anthile was very successful in Europe, but he stopped being successful and he went to the US, went back to the US to Hollywood. And in Hollywood, he met, while he was doing music for movies, he met Haiti. But let me tell you the story of the Mechanic Ballet. So George was in Europe in this time. This was a piece that was very advanced for its time. I don't remember. It, it had um, propellers, uh, plane propellers in terms of sounds. And it had 16 pianolas. A ver, no, después se las muestro. Antes de mostrárselas, voy a mostrar. Escuchen un poquito, porque eso es lo que había aquí. Listen to a little bit of this. This piece. The version I'm going to share you, it has the movie synchronized with it. This is something modern, but it was never seen like this originally. So let's listen.
máquina. Voy a adelantar un poco porque no I'm going to fast forward a bit because it's pretty long. Okay, bueno. Pueden escucharla. Luego, pero yo quisiera solamente... You can listen to this later, but I just want to show it to you so we can talk about a few things. Firstly, the pianolas, for you, those of you who don't know it, are pianos that play automatically, which were very common in the high society, European high society in the 19th century. Either you... You played an instrument or you had a lot of money for a quartet to come to your house. And later all the, the gramophone comes in, but in the beginning they were very bad quality. So these were something that allowed us to listen to anything. It worked with some paper rolls that had the score the notes and in the 19th century you could get all kinds of works for this piano to play it was an automatic so the issue that the pianola has it doesn't have the expressiveness that a that a real composer musician would have bueno por supuesto al principio nadie imaginaba que una pianola podía ser. So in the ser. beginning, no one could, could imagine that a pianola could be a useful instrument in orchestra music. But there were composers that started to use it. Hernán Carroll is one. And the other one is our protagonist, Joris Intel. The beauty of using a pianola is it doesn't have a limit in terms of the amount of fingers that you need or the speed. It can You can play up to 15 keys and play as fast as you want. So this brought a kind of charm, charm to the piece. Esta mezcla entre lo humano y la frialdad. So this mixture between humanity and the coldness of the in mechanical industry, it mixed these pianolas with human interpreters. So the original piece was for 16 of these pianolas. And there was a problem in my 1924 that was huge for Rental. how to synchronize the 16 pianolas. It was technologically impossible. La, el ballet mecánico. And you never could execute the, the mechanical ballet with the, his original idea. Imagine there are 16 pianolas that have to start simultaneously. That was really difficult to get done in that time. Only in 1999 did this piece play originally where the pianolas were controlled by computers. It was the only way for them to start, to be synchronized and play simultaneously. So the synchronization of the pianolas was a topic that obsessed a George Antel. This technological problem, music, calling, technology. He wasn't an engineer, he didn't really care. But he thought long and hard Resolver. trying to resolve, solve this problem that his art has asked him to solve. So in a conversation one night with his great friend, Heidi Lamar, they talked about the torpedo system. And Heidi told him that she had the, that he had the problem of synchronizing the frequency that the controller 
used with the torpedo. Then he thought what they should do is install one of these rolls within the torpedo and the other roll in the operator so that simultaneously they were changing frequencies in the same way that Antal wanted to simultaneously play the same keys. So this story is told in many different places. I'm going to share a slide about this that ends up in this patent that we see here from the 10th of June of 1941. I honestly get goosebumps when I see this because it's wonderful. Look what we see in that square. This is the original patent. This is in Google. You can download it completely with its drawings. Furthermore, we contemplate employing records of the type used for many years in player pianos and which consist of long rolls of paper having perforations variously positioned in the plural, plurality of longitudinal rolls along the records. In a conventional player piano record, there, there may be 88 rows of perforations, and in our system, such a record will permit the use of 88 different carrier frequencies. So it's really nice and ironic in a way that a military technology have 88 frequency. It could have been 90 or 24, but it has 88 because the piano is present in a military technology. Music is present. This was never brought to practice. The patent was accepted. But there are other types of problems and, and they found better solutions. But technology was used there were a lot of people that arrived to the same destination, but Haiti Lamar, in the years 2000, she was celebrated in electrical engineering, for example. She's become a symbol, an important symbol in the feminist fight, the plight, for being a woman who was very abused by her husband that had to that had to make herself be seen as a dumb bimbo and who eventually ran away and developed technolog technological arm thanks to her wit and music and cinema. Well, could this pap patent have existed without music? Definitely not. Maybe technology would have happened either way, but this is an example, a wonderful example, of the union that mu that has always been between okay. these two disciplines. So that was one story, an introduction. Now I want to go in a more technical story, and more important because somehow it marked the history of science and our music. The birth of science. I'm going to talk with about music for this. You guys are going to forgive me. I know there are many mus classical musicians here, and I'm using pop music. I hope you accept it. Okay, tenemos, tenemos que parar porque no voy a tener tiempo. Tengo que, tengo que... Right, we're going to stop because we don't have much time left. This is a very famous song, The Beach Boys, an American band in the 60s, for those who don't know. It was a very important band. 
Incluso si ustedes no son fans de la música. Even if you're not fans of pop music like the Beach Boys or, or the Beatles. Eh, borraron las fronteras entre la música. They erased the, the frontiers between pop and classical music. The same way like George and, and Heidi Lamar erased the divide between technologically tec technology and cinema. So the Beach Boys publish an album called Bed Sounds. The Beatles publish Revolver, release Revolver. And you should really listen to them. So Brian Wilson was the genius, the leader behind the band. They're three brothers. And Brian Wilson composed the song when he was 16, very young. It was his first song. It's a simple song, but it has an important aspect. It's nice in a way that doesn't require any instruction or it gives you that impression. No one can not like listening to those vocal harmonies, those melodies. It's like something that directly enters your heart. I want to do a, a, a gastronomic analysis. So there's sugar that everyone loves. The children love it. And this is tonic water that not everyone likes. And there's a deep reason, and I want to tell you in science, the reason is evolutionary. Sugar has in their molecules that are full of energy. We need that energy to, to think, to move. And of course, someone to survive requires energy. So evidently, evolution has made us attracted to sugar. If we're born, if someone is born and they don't like sugar, if, uh, if there's a lack of food, or then they will just starve and die. So this is also a way of surviving to be attracted to sugar. So the way that that we are attracted to meat, meat has a lot of amino acids and other things. Well, proto uh, beans, legumes have them too. But we need amino acids to construct proteins in our cells. These are the fundamental molecules of life. We also like fat because they have a lot of energy. On the other side, we don't like tonic water. A child doesn't like tonic water because it's bitter. Bitter is a sign of danger. Venom, poison is bitter. We don't like things that are rotten. We don't eat something rotten. We don't like it because that's another sign of danger. There are bacteria that could be corrosive, harmful. El alimento. These bacteria are what rot the food. So it's a sign to not eat that food. So we like tonic water, beer, coffee. We like rotten things. Blue cheese, we love. There's a controlled way of doing this. There's something that called culture that allow these weird things to happen. Like for us liking blue cheese and beer. So there's a biological line between sugar and tonic water. So I want to do an analogy with sugar. So this is an a cappella version. Pure sugar. Incluso algunos pure sugar. Even some say too much sugar. Too sugary. This is the opposite. Cuarteto de cuerdas número 3 de Schoenberg. The Schoenberg uh, chord quartet number 3. This is something we don't like when we're children, for example. It's an acquired taste, like the <laughs> tonic water, coffee, and blue cheese. We see this in, 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 in the practice. It's, there's obviously music that's simpler, 
music that's so simple that doesn't mean that it that it's bad or worse but there's other music that requires preparation and culture so the question is is it identical is there an explanation to give to understand why there's music that feels like sugar and other that feels like tonic water or blue cheese? And the answer is that I don't know. He leído I really don't know. I've read many theories. I've spoke to a lot of friends and this is a topic that doesn't really have a absolute answer. There isn't a consensus. There are many things that have been written. What advantage could a good air, a musical, a good musical air give us as human beings? But there isn't an, an agreement. There are people that think that there are certain universal aspects of music, other people that think there is purely cultural. So these Beach Boys that we hear, so so lovely, maybe for another culture, it's, they're not nice at all. So that's a long story, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but just to show you what was the first man that proposed an idea towards this direction to understand this. This man was Pythagoras. Pythagoras created a theory of, of, of what's beautiful, ugly. He didn't, he didn't create a theory like that. He just asked a question. Why are there sounds that sound nice when they're together or close or happen success successively? He just asked this simple question. And the answer that he gave created the first scientific theory that was ever existed. Someone could disagree with me. Maybe it's one of the first, but it's the first scientific theory in, in the West that we have uh, a registry of. It's a very important theory with a lot of meaning. Let me talk to you a little bit about this. But first I want to show you and tell you a little bit about the Greeks or the Pythagoras. The Pythagoras were, were around the uh, 16th century before Christ. They didn't distinguish much between the, dif the disciplines. So I want you to, for the Greeks, there was music, astronomy, philosophy, religion, and it was all part of the same thing. For them, the most important thing, the, the, the source, the sustenance of all the ideas were the numbers, not just any numbers, the numbers we consider as whole numbers. One, two, three, four. The first numbers had interpretations, numbers. This symbol, for example, was a sacred symbol. It's called the tetractus. And they had an oath when you enter to the Pythagoric school. I swear by the discoverer of Detractus, owner of our wisdom, the root of the source of nature. This is where there was the heart and soul of all things where there were numbers. This is the philosophy behind the Pythagoras. This symbol... This is pretty similar to the cross for the Christians, the star to the Jewish. This triangle are the 10 points, 10 for the first 10 numbers. 10 is very important because we have 10 fingers. And the 10 points are ordered in a triangle. The first is one point, the second two points, three and four. This represents the first four natural numbers. That was the mystique of the Pythagoras, their theory. 
So any nice thing, any aesthetical thing had to be explained with these four smaller numbers. So I'm going to show you another song from 1963, from the Beatles. So they're in re minor, major, sorry. I'm going to be more precise with you guys since you're musicians. Okay. Pero yo lo que les quiero mostrar solamente es las notas. What I want to show you really are, are the notes. The musicians. Este es el puente de la canción. I'm going to be surprised by this. This is the bridge. Y en ese, en ese puente hay cuatro notas. In that bridge, there are four notes that represent... The history, the Quiero history también ser preciso como Beatle maníaco en esta canción. As Beatles were. No es de los Beatles, es de los Isley Brothers. This is a, the Beatles song, it's from the Isley Brothers. It's a cover from the Beatles. Entonces, las notas que están presentes. So the notes that are present, I drew them. No tienen ninguna importancia para la charla. But they they're not really important to this talk. Y aquí, si hay alguien escuchándome con oído absoluto, a decir que me equivoqué. No There's es que me someone equivoqué. listening to me. I didn't make a mistake. Pero hay una grabación que hicieron para el Ed Sullivan Show en vivo en Estados Unidos. En que está transpuesta. They, they made a show. They recorded this for Ed Sullivan. And, de los para esta Entonces, John Lennon para and the liar is a little lower. That's what you hear. So John Lennon starts, George Harrison, Paul McCartney, and then Todd. Entonces quiero hacer un análisis pitagórico en lugar de. So I want to do a Pythagorean analysis. So Pythagoras. Let's look at these figures. He experimented with chords. So let's see the liar that I have here is such that all the chords have the same amount of tension. Tension has an interesting definition of physics. It's intuitive, you know, the, let's, the tension of the rope. Let's think about that. So imagine two chords where I hang two weights, equal weights, has the same, they have the same tension. So with different bodies, with different weights, I get different tension. But to understand the Pythagoric theory, let's imagine they all have the same tension. So going to the first part, tension, the tension of the player pianos and pianos is so great. I can't remember the exact number, but you can... The sum of the tensions of all the chords of a piano, you could hang a truck on it. It was It's a marvelous creation of the 19th century, and it also created military equipment. So we have all the chords with the same tension. So let's say this one... Una cuerda que mide exactamente la mitad y tiene la misma tensión. Entonces. So let's say the second chord measures half. So the first is measures one. The second measures half. But it's the same tension. So it's an, it's an eighth over the other. Pónganse en los pantalones. For you this might be obvious, but now put yourself in Pythagoras. Son dos notas distintas. So these notes are two different notes. They're so similar, yet they still they have the same name. We call it the same. They're both la. They're very similar. They're so similar. 
that that isn't cultural. We've, we've done experiments that show that it doesn't matter where we go or how far behind in time, they're, they're flutes that have 30,000 years and we know how they sound because have they have the holes in different places and we know how to, how they were played. So we know from ancient cultures and the, the eighth is universal. For Pythagoras, that's not important. What's noticeable is that there's one and there's half. So the reason be, be, behind those chords is that two is to one. The first two numbers are from the tetractes, the, the main, the two main numbers. So Pythagoras stopped his heart for a second and he thought, well, what if I take the second and the third row of the tetractes and create chords with the dimensions two to three? The present musicians, you would have heard a fifth. The fifth is the second interval plus consonant. It's quite universal, even though it's debatable. And that's where Pythagoras was aesthetic. So that one is to two, created the eighth, and the second, third to four, created the fifth. We'll talk about this. The second I have to show you is in a tetractus because tetractus ends at the fourth row, so it doesn't have a fifth. But let's see this one. So these three notes that are there, one, two thirds, and four fifths, two chords that are in the reason four to five sound good. It's third major. And with those three fractions, we create the major triad that is the combination of notes, which are protagonists to the Western history of music. As much as many theories of this is still particularly popular music in many cultures that prevails. So Pythagoras found that these Fractions had to do had relation. Oops, yo ya me estoy, tengo que apurar. Bueno, entonces me voy a apurar. Voy a, yo creo que el tercer tema no llego. Okay, I'm gonna hurry because we're running out of time. The, the next fraction, nine over sixteen. So if I compare the first note with this one, which eh, Paul McCartney sings, the two cards. 9 over 16. So this is 16, this is 9. That's the one that sounds the worst. It has the most tension. It's a seventh minor. The only thing I want to show you is that even though they're, just because they're big numbers makes it uglier and and that correlates with the fact that it doesn't sound as well this is a th wonderful theory that seems to be successful the theory says that the the reasons of the chorus when they're in smaller number they sound better it doesn't matter if it's cultural or true. it's a scientific theory so what do we understand for a scientific theory it's a relationship unequivocal relationship between the abstract universe of the mind, of the numbers that are... Only man has numbers. Only the human mind has generated numbers. So the universe of fractions and reasoning is a an abstract universe. And unite that to do a... The, so do a theory is to unite that world with experiments, phenomena, sounds, in this case, sounds. So you, I'm sure you agree that this theory is successful, 
while the numbers are smaller, more alike are the sounds. Well, at the higher they go, they sound, they sound worse. The Pythagoras theory is a great theory, but it fails in some things. Well, you'll say that this is not a theory, this is craziness. It's a game. No, this isn't a, a game. It actually created a scientific theory that's very important in music, which is the Pythagorean fine tuning. Back in the day, well, up till today, to, to fine tune is something that only people with really good hearing can do. So there was someone who was designated to tune, to fine tune. How would we, but how would we fine tune if we don't really know what things are supposed to sound like? So how to objectively fine tune an instrument? This is where the Pythagoric theory comes in place with these numbers, one, two, and three. So if I have a chord that measures one and it's a fa, to say it's a, a fa, and you divide it in three parts and you take out two, so with the same tension, it, it would be do. If you don't know music, it's fine. It's a, we call it a fifth. So I take out a third, and if I cut half of the do, then I have half of that that creates another fa. If, if I cut two thirds of the do, so two thirds of two thirds is four over nine, and it becomes a sol. You guys know this better than I do. The circle of the fifths. If I start with fa, I cut it two thirds. I get a do, I cut it two thirds, I get it a sol, I cut it two thirds, I get a re, and so on. I get the seven notes of the of the Western scale. So the Pythagoras invented the Western. You could, you could fine tune an uh, instrument with a ruler, not with your ear, with a, with a ruler. A ruler is an object that has nothing to do with music, but it allows me to be objective. Well, it gets complicated. You guys can continue. You get all the, all the notes in the chromatic scale. So all the chords can be achieved with this method. I'm going to show you something, some, also from Pythagoras, that doesn't seem to have a relation. You probably haven't heard about this. Musicians, maybe you have. There's a theory of Pythagoras that says if I have a triangle, rectangle, and this measures one and one. So this to the second power creates the hypotenuse. So one to the second power plus one to second power will give you the right, the square root of two to the second power. And it's a mysterious theory because all Pythagorean. So if I have a, a gate that measures one by one and I wanna buy a gate, I want to go to the store and buy another gate. I would need a number to present. So what was that? It's the root of two. So Pythagoras thought it would be like 140 divided by 111 because that's all that they knew at the time. So someone in the school demonstrated that. Ese miembro. You couldn't. Find the root of a number in that way. They say that he, this man was apparently thrown into the ocean because he really questioned the, the theory, the theory of Pythagoras. So what do you think? So these numbers don't really exist. They're not small numbers. 
What if I take a chord that measures one and one that measures the square root of two? It sounds ugly, I guess. Depends on the person, but they're two, they're two chords that sound kind of weird. This is known as the Jimi Hendrix and the Pythagorean nightmare theory. So take a listen. Y ahí tienen un ejemplo en rock de There you have an example of, of, of rock. Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix that starts with a with a la and a re and two eighths. And it sounds fantastic because Jimi Hendrix, want, what he wanted to do was give us an uncomfortable feeling. And there are many other examples in classical music. This shows that also culture enters and we become accustomed and we start to like it. How can, some guys say, how can there be a root of two in the Pythagorean theory? And I'm going to end with this. So it's how in science we tend to approximate. This is what you see is the first 10,000 digits of a square root of two. The square root of two is one comma four, one, two. But if I keep looking at the numbers, I don't really see a pattern. The fractions and the numbers are numbers that repeat forever. For example, a third is 0 0.33333. It has infinite numbers, but it repeats. Or it ends. 1, 1.4. This number doesn't have a pattern or a repetition. There are many mythic, mystics that try to find one. It's pi, right? The symbol pi, 314. It's a terrible number. In not Pythagoras. So what we use today is not the Pythagoras scale because it has a lot of problems. We have a tempered scale that use, ironically, the root of two as a protagonist. Of course, the new theory isn't that different from the old theories. So if you compare the triton between the fraction, so you have to multiply by two thirds always, two thirds by two thirds, all of the notes come up. So effectively, the interval between lengths of chords if, or frequencies in the Pythagorean theory. So 729 divided by 512 is horrible with big numbers, equals 1, 423, So those are fractions. The root of 2 is 1, 4, 1, 4, 2, 1, 3. But you can see that they're very similar. So people who have an ear as not as good as mine will not realize in terms when fine tuning. I'm not going to be able to finish. So I just want to thank you, each and every one of you, for listening to me today. Okay. So I say goodbye and thank you all. Bye.